Welcome tonight to the London Luminaries, 12 historic organisations working collectively to celebrate our collective heritage. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill. Thank you, Rachel, for that introduction. And thank you uh, to those of you who are here live tonight and welcome to those of you who are going to be joining us later, who have joined us later in the virtual realm of YouTube. It's a real pleasure to have uh, an audience in these difficult times. As uh, Rachel said, we're wanting to share our enthusiasm for and our knowledge of a, a variety of uh, historic venues in the West of London. And we've been doing that in a series of lectures by choosing a theme that allows us to tell the stories about the people and the ideas that bring this area to life. And our theme for this so series is relationships, in a way, relationships between creativity and power. We're looking at poets, painters, patrons, and politicians. Tonight, our speaker is going to be focusing on the work of one such patron, um, Henrietta Howard, Countess of Suffolk, who created an extraordinary collection and a beautiful building to house it in at Marble Hill House. Let me introduce um, our speaker tonight for you. It's Dr. Tessa Kilgariff, who's a curator of collections and interiors at English Heritage, where she researches and cares for the paintings, furniture and decorative art collections across two 18th century Palladian villas, Marble Hill and Chiswick House. She's currently at work on the Marble Hill Revive project, where her central focus has been representing the house as the home of Henrietta Howard. And I'd like to um, hand over now to Tessa for her talk. Thank you very much, Judith, for the introduction. Uh, this evening, I am going to bring to life the painting collection formed by Marble Hill's first owner, Henrietta Howard. It was, in fact, relatively modest. Henrietta owned only 34 paintings, including five Capricci, or fanciful invented views of Rome by Giovanni Paolo Pinini. This talk will not only explore Henrietta's collecting habits, but will also examine how the current collection offers an insight into the 18th century British art world. In particular, I will bring into focus the exquisite small scale portraits by Gowan Hamilton, Francis Heyman, and Hubert Francois Graveler. So who was Henrietta Howard? Here she is, more on this portrait a little later on. Henrietta was an influential courtier, patron of the arts, friend of poets and politicians, and also the mistress of the future King George II. Although she came from a very promising background, spending her early life at Blickling Hall in Norfolk, tragedy soon struck Henrietta. When she was 10, her father, Sir Henry Hobart, was killed in a duel and only three years later, her mother also died. Her marriage to Charles Howard, a son of the Earl of Suffolk, only brought her despair. He was violent, a gambler, a drunk, and in debt. And he also pulled them into poverty. In pursuit of a much better life, Henrietta fled to seek favor with England's future monarchs at their home in Hanover, Germany. When they came to the English throne, she was given a place in the household of the Princess of Wales, later Queen Caroline, and later she lived at Kensington Palace. Henrietta became known at court for her discretion and her taste. She also, as I've mentioned, became mistress to the Prince of Wales, later George II. At this time, the role of mistress was something of a court position. Uh, it was an essential addition to the Prince's grandeur. It offered Henrietta a degree of protection from her abusive husband and also some financial independence. While at court, Henrietta started laying the foundations for a brand new life. With some of the age's greatest designers, such as the Ninth Earl of Pembroke and the architect Colin Campbell, she started to build Marble Hill. This portrait of Henrietta by Charles Jervis dates from the time that she was building her new home. It had belonged to Alexander Pope, and in his will, he left it to his beloved friend, Martha Blount. At Martha's sale, Henrietta bought it and gave it to Horace Walpole, who hung it in the round chamber at Strawberry Hill in memory of the many happy hours he had spent with her gossiping about court scandals in the reign of King George II. 
Henrietta is shown in a pose and a setting normally reserved for male writers on a rocky hillside in front of an imaginary vista. And English Heritage was able to purchase this in 1994. Around the time that this was painted, Henrietta also obtained a legal separation from her abusive husband. 10 years later, in the mid 1730s, she was finally able to leave royal service and enjoy her hard fought for new life on the bank of the Thames. I have already mentioned that Henrietta's paintings collection was quite modest in size, but where does she find the funds to create it and indeed to build Marble Hill? It was almost certainly from George II's gift of 11,000 pounds worth of stock, jewels, plate and furniture, which was given to her in 1723. One of the reasons why I think it's important for us to think about Henrietta's collection is because aside from the decade when she was married to her second husband, George Barclay, a much happier marriage from around 1735 until his death in 1746, every room at Marble Hill can be considered a woman's domain. With relatively few examples of collections owned by women in the mid 18th century, Henrietta's paintings take on an additional significance. Though we know the total number of paintings from inventories, only a small number of those original works are still at Marble Hill today. Henrietta had intended the contents to remain in, her, in the house for, for her heirs to be able to enjoy. And although she did include this clause in her will, the contents of the entire house were actually dispersed by the time Marble Hill was open to the public in 1903. Five paintings from that original collection are displayed in the great room on the first floor. Um, and here I'm showing you the great room pre Marble Hill revived project. You'll have to come and see what it looks like when we reopen it later this spring. And this is really the heart of the collection and where I would like us to begin our exploration of Henrietta's paintings. All five paintings now in the great room were created by the same artist, Giovanni Paolo Panini, who lived from 1691 to 1765. They are, and you can see um, three of them here in the great room, titled Landscape with the Colosseum, Landscape with the Arch of Constantine, Landscape with the Pantheon, Landscape with the Column of Trajan, and Statues in a Ruined Arcade. And here I've just selected two so you can look at them in greater detail. Panini was born in Piacenza, but he spent the largest part of his career working in Rome, where he painted decorative frescoes and architectural views. He was a master of architectural perspective and considered the greatest of 18th century view painters. Henrietta used her great room to gather her wide social circle. It was a place to listen to music, to play cards and for lively conversation. These five paintings complemented the Palladian features of the room and helped to demonstrate her sophisticated taste. Positioned above the doors and the fireplace, it's a unique set of romanticized views of Rome. They're not real places, but capricci, imagined. So what Panini has done is take real buildings and put them into made up settings. These places are in reality much further apart from each other, but he dramatizes the paintings by kind of creating a spectacular mashup and littering the foreground with antiquities and statues. Panini specialized in these paintings, showing these groups of famous ruins in ancient sculpture, and they were very popular with British 18th century grand tourists wishing to take home a souvenir of Rome. For Henrietta, who never visited Italy, they provided a painted tour of the city. The grand tour was reserved for young aristocratic men in the most part, so Henrietta didn't have this opportunity. The paintings were removed by the last private owners of Marble Hill in 1900. And in the 1980s, they were gradually rediscovered in collections as far afield as America and the south of France and eventually brought back to Marble Hill. There were three more important paintings in the Great Room, but sadly, none of them are actually in situ today. So what were these missing puzzle pieces and where did they sit? So all three of these works were actually fitted into the panelling, into the wainscot of the room. One was a copy of Van Dyck's hunting portrait of King Charles I, the original of which is now in the Louvre, and I've um, put up this image of it here, so you can see what it would have looked like. 
and its pendant across the entrance of the door was a copy of Van Dyck's portrait of Lord John Stuart and Lord Bernard Stuart, which is probably familiar to many of you because it is in the collection at the National Gallery today. So again, copies. The third copy that Henrietta owned was a copy after Rubens, um, a virgin and the child with St. Elizabeth and the child Baptist. Marble Hills, the Marble Hill version of this painting was probably copied from the Rubens, which is now in the Walker Art Gallery. Rubens created a, a number of paintings along um, of this subject. And that probably happened when it was, uh, when the original was in, Devonshire, was in Devonshire House and William Kent made a frame for it. Putty um, were added into the Marble Hill painting so that it fit the height of the frame. What do these works tell us about Henrietta's taste and her interests? Some scholars have noted that the subject matter wouldn't necessarily make sense for someone like Henrietta who owed her court position to the Protestant Hanoverian succession. But in fact, Henrietta's choice of art probably had more to do with architecture and taste, especially um, to do with Inigo Jones and the Palladian style. Her friend Walpole remarked about, quote, the scenes which Jones and Van Dyck had decorated at Wilton House and admired Rubens's painted ceiling for Inigo Jones's banqueting house. This suggests that Van Dyck and Rubens were included in the cult um, of Inigo Jones because of the association of their work with that of Jones at Wilton and at Whitehall. And we know that the great room at Marble Hill was consciously modeled on Wilton on, on the single cube room there, so um, which was decorated with authentic portraits by Van Dyck. And here I am showing you the paintings as they originally, uh, well, not as they originally would have appeared, but as they appeared um, around uh, just before they left Marble Hill. And you can see that Marble Hill, the Great Room had quite a different um, uh, architecture, um, decorative scheme um, at that moment there. Um, the present Van Dyke copies, which are now in the Great Room, which you can see one here, um, they were acquired in 1965 by English Heritage, again, because they helped to replicate um, the Van Dyke copies that she had in that room originally. So fitting substitutes, but not the exact um, subject matter that Henrietta owned. The next space that we come to on our tour is Henrietta's bedchamber, where there were at least two, one or two paintings displayed during her occupation. The 1890s sales particular note, quote, two panels on the wall were fitted with fine oil paintings, a portrait and a garden scene with, with a portrait of George II and equestrian figures. Though these works have not been traced with certainty, English heritage has sought to acquire another painting which, fits, which perfectly fits the classical inspiration of Henrietta's bedchamber, which is divided by the grand architectural screen that you can see here just at the foot of the bed. This is Richard Wilson's The Thames near Marble Hill, Twickenham. Here we have a beautiful image of it um, from around uh, 1762. In his paintings, Wilson transformed the stretch of the Thames between Richmond and Twickenham into an Italianate riverscape. Given the Italian roots of the Palladian style, it seemed um, giving the Palladian roots of the Italian style, it was an especially appropriate setting for Henrietta's villa which can be glimpsed on the far bank amongst the trees. If you look very, very carefully here, you can just see white marble hill shining out. Wilson chose to paint this area because of its reputation as an English Arcadia, making it a suitable subject for the idealized and classical style that Wilson had developed whilst he was studying in Italy. The next stop on our tour of Henrietta's collection we need to ascend the steep stone stair to the second floor of Marble Hill and enter her gallery. This was a space where Henrietta and her guests could enjoy strolling, especially on rainy days when it wasn't right to go out into the wet. They could admire some of Henrietta's painting collection. And it was also a wonderful place to enjoy the sweeping views of Henrietta's garden and the river beyond. And I want you to imagine that you are just here um, Imagine that you're at the top right window and you're looking out onto the boats passing by as Henrietta and her guests would have. 
The inventories tell us that there were nine pictures in the gallery and the London and Middlesex survey by Norris Brewer tells us that some of these were portraits, quote, let into framework forming part of the finishing of the room. Among these are George II, when Prince of Wales and the Countess of Suffolk, end quote. Again, we can only speculate on exactly which portrait of George II this was, but there are two now in the collection of Marble Hill, which have been subsequently purchased. The first shown here is this very official uh, portrait of uh, King George II, who um, I have to note really disliked having his portrait painted and refused to sit for many of the leading artists of the day. It, this is one is thought to be by the Swiss painter Bartholomew Dupin, who came to England in 1743. The second has a more personal quality, this portrait by Charles Phillips from around 1738. This one is thought to allude to the death of George II's wife, Queen Caroline, in 1737, so just, just prior to when we think it was created. The setting is probably the anteroom of the new library in St. James's Palace, Westminster. The library was built to house the Queen's collection, and it was there that she was taken ill. A bust of Queen Caroline is positioned just above the door here. And while the empty throne could be said to symbolize her absence, and there are other elements such as this rich carpet and the playing pugs in the foreground, which are commonplace for conversation pieces of the period. As we've seen, the dispersal of Henrietta's collection and the paucity of information contained within the inventories means that relatively few works that adorned the walls of Marble Hill in the mid 18th century are known today. For that reason, since the 1960s, English heritage curators have sought to evoke the intimate atmosphere of Henrietta's villa through means of collecting representative works of art for the British art world at that period. They give us a snapshot and also help us to imagine this moment where the Rococo style is being introduced from Europe and the native school of painting is emerging. I'm going to focus on works displayed in two rooms that we haven't yet explored on my paintings tour of Marble Hill. First, um, the breakfast parlor, which is shown here. Henrietta started her day in this intimate room and she would have tea, a breakfast of bread and butter, and that would be prepared in the service wing, uh, which used to adjoin Marble Hill, but was demolished in 1909. Small scale, and small scale portraits and conversation pieces will be hung in the breakfast parlor when we reopen to add to the intimate domestic atmosphere of that room. And I'm going to share some of these jewel-like works now from the collection. The first of which is uh, Le Lecteur by Gravelot from around 1745. Gravelot helped to introduce lightness, elegance, and other typical qualities of the French Rococo style to English art. Born and trained in Paris, he was in England from 1732 to 1745, when this intimate scene of a man and a woman reading, a man reading to a woman, was probably painted. Gravelot has captured the intricate details of clothing worn during the 1740s, um, such as particularly this really beautifully textured pink uh, quilted skirt that you can see here. It is also quite a rare um, conversation piece by Gravelot, who didn't actually paint in oil very frequently at all. The second here is a portrait of John Conyers by Francis Heyman. Heyman specialized in small scale full length portraits such as this one of John Conyers. He was a member of parliament. The framed painting in the background that you can see here in this rather large gold frame um, depicts Conyers country estate, Cot Hall in Essex. It's a miniature version of a, pew, of, a view, of a view painted in 1746 by one of Heyman's great friends, uh, George, the painter Lord George Lambert. And he did this to record the old hall before it was demolished because Conyers, much like Henrietta, wanted to build a new classically inspired Palladian home. And this exact painting that you can see uh, in the kind of painting within a painting is actually now in the collection um, at Tate. The third work is a conversation piece, another group portrait. Um, and these, these types of uh, intimate domestic interior portraits became popular in the 1730s. Um, in this one, we see uh, Gowan Hamilton, the artist has painted Henrietta's close neighbors, the Duke and Duchess of Montague. 
who used the now demolished Ragman's Castle adjacent to Orleans House as their riverside retreat. The Duke is pointing here, if you look carefully at the table, um, to a heart on his playing card, which is an allusion to the marriage of his daughter Mary in 1730. We move now to the dressing room at Marble Hill. Again, it looks very different, uh, so please do come, come back and see it. Um, in the mornings, Henrietta entertained her close friends in this room and probably also used it when writing letters to her extensive social circle. Um, the dressing room, the new dressing room hang, I should say, uh, will represent Henrietta's friends, her acquaintances, um, and such as Horace Walpole, who we've already briefly mentioned, who I'll just mention in passing now, a frequent visitor uh, to Marble Hill. Walpole was a generation younger than Henrietta and enjoyed listening to her memories of her time at court. Their warm friendship is recorded in their letters. This portrait by John Giles Eckhart makes Walpole's position as Henrietta's near neighbour clear as he poses before his Twickenham home, Strawberry Hill. And I'm uh, keeping my remarks short because uh, Martin Possel next week will do a much deeper dive into um, Eckhart and Walpole, which I'm looking forward to. In the centre here, we have a um, portrait of John Gay. And Henrietta actually owned um, a portrait of her friend and the poet, um, her friend, the poet and dramatist, John Gay, um, and she kept that in her apartment at court. Gay was actually one of the first people to learn about her plans for Marble Hill, although she asked him to keep it a secret. In 1723, she wrote to him, quote, I beg you will never mention the plan which you found in my room, end quote. So she was uh, concerned to keep it a secret to ensure that her, her great scheme would come to fruition. And then finally on this slide, we have um, Catherine Hyde, the Duchess of Queensberry, here as a dairy maid. This version is um, after Charles Jervis. Henrietta's friend, the Duchess of Queensberry, lived at Petersham, just across the river on the opposite bank of the Thames to Marble Hill. She wrote in 1734 that she wished she had, quote, wings like a dove in order to fly away to Marble Hill and be at rest, end quote. Horace Walpole was it turns out rather glad that she didn't have wings like a glove and perhaps he enjoyed her company less because he exclaimed, quote, thank God the Thames is between me and the Duchess of Queensbury. So what has our tour of Henrietta Howard's art collection shown us about her taste and understanding of 18th century painting and why should we care? As I've said, it's important for us to think about this because aside from that one decade um, when she was married to her second husband, George Barclay, every room at Marble Hill really is a woman's domain. And we've learned that Henrietta was discerning and she followed fashionable Palladian principles in selecting Roman Capricci and copies after Van Dyck for her great room. And it has shown her strong friendships and involvement in the exchange of portraits of familiar names from this lecture series like Walpole and Pope. However, we also need to recognize that Henrietta was not a great connoisseur of paintings like her neighbor, Lord Burlington, who owned 167 uh, paintings at Chiswick House. And she didn't actually have any old master paintings on her walls, and neither did she perhaps have the means to acquire them. Nor was she a really avid collector. When we compare the 34 paintings that she owned to, in another instance, the 56 portraits that were owned by Alexander Pope, we understand the modesty again of her collection and indeed that 56 actually only covers his portraits and he's known to have uh, landscapes and other historical works too. My talk today has only considered Henrietta's paintings and I urge you to listen to her, Esme Wood, but, but her collection of furniture, ceramics, decorative arts and textiles is equally engaging and I urge you to listen to Esme Whitaker's uh, talk which is on the Marble Hill YouTube channel to, which covers that in much more detail. Um, particularly her interest in chinoiserie. And it's definitely the case that Henrietta reserved the kind of collecting impulse, her covetous side, uh, for collecting porcelain. She was passionate about it. Collecting porcelain was an enthusiasm shared by her friends, such as Lady Betty Germain, and Henrietta's porcelain collection was displayed not only in the main house, but also in a purpose-built china room located nearby in the gardens, but unfortunately demolished in 1909. Henrietta described that room, which had carved gilt edge shelves and a painted arch ceiling, um, rather at odds with the understated elegance of Marble Hill. Um, Henrietta described it as the admiration of the vulgar. 
the sheer quantity of porcelain contained in that room overwhelmed the compiler of, her 17, of the 1767 inventory of Marble Hill, and he actually gave up counting the pieces. The hybrid painting collection at Marble Hill, part original, part subsequent efforts by generations of English heritage curators to evoke the atmosphere of Henrietta's home, is a good example of the challenges faced by everyone who works in special heritage places. Um, and for example, many of the people represented by the London Luminaries group. How do you poise scrupulous documentary authenticity on the one hand with creating atmosphere, variety and excitement if you do not have the whole original collection available to you? One of the major ways that we can do that is through interpretation and storytelling. And our volunteers are essential in enabling us to share the stories of Marble Hill with our visitors. So this is my concluding note today that if you are interested in Marble Hill, which will be open free of charge in five days a week, why not consider joining us as a volunteer room exclaimer, ex explainer and exclaimer? The details are on this slide and Rachel Morrison will be delighted for you to be in touch. And now I'm going to hand back to Judith. Thank you so much, um, Tessa, for that fascinating talk. First of all, I want to, while this slide is on the screen, um, do a plug, as you've very kindly done a, a, a plug for, for volunteers, a plug for other talks in the series, including the forthcoming talk next week on Horace Walpole and Eckhart, which will be just fascinating, and on uh, painters uh, of a very different style, Hogarth and, and Turner. Tessa also mentioned previous talks on Marble Hill House itself, and all of these from the autumn and from our two previous series can be seen on YouTube. 